going to get some housekeeping things out of the way, starting with the evaluation forms that you are either sitting on or that you may have looked at. Please, before you leave today, complete those forms and leave them here on the um, desktop on your way out the door. They really do, terrific information really does help us in planning future programs. And we're always in future program planning mode. <laughs> So um, please complete those forms. And you will also find on your chairs and over here at the exit as well, the list of other programs that we have scheduled for Open Access Week this week. And at UCSB, we are doing Open Access Weeks this year. So we've got programs going into next week as well. So take a look at those and see if there are other programs that are of interest to you. And please come. You see things of interest to um, friends and colleagues, please encourage them to attend um, as well. Okay, so there's some blue scholarly communication brochures that we have here as well. And these basically just give you an overview of some of the services that we have in the library that support scholarly publishing and other scholarly communication endeavors on campus. So take a look at these, um, help yourself to them um, on your way out the door. So that pretty much, oh, one more thing, sorry. Uh, most important thing, actually, we have a number of co-sponsors for our activities regarding scholarly communication, our open access week this year, and I'd just like to give a big shout out to them, including the Bren School. Anybody here from the Bren School? Okay, well maybe next week when we have a Bren Patsy person on our panel. Um, the Center for Information Technology and Society, the Department of Chemistry, the Department of Economics, any economics, economists in the house? <laughs> Student <laughs> economists? <laughs> Just one. Just one. <laughs> okay. Well, welcome. And we have the Graduate Division who is um, supporting our programming this year, as well as Office of Research and the Academic Senate's Council on Research and Instructional Services. So, without further ado, I'm going to bring up my boss, Janet Marturano, who is Associate University Librarian for Collection Services, to introduce Ted and on with the show. <laughs> Thank you, guys. <laughs> so, I'd also like to welcome you, and thank you for coming today. Um, so, what's the big deal? Journal pricing secrets exposed. So what is the big deal, and is it really a deal? Our speaker today, UCSB economics professor Ted Bergstrom, has explored those questions in detail. The big deal refers to a journal pricing model where publishers sell journals in large packages or bundles. And it's not unlike cable TV packages where you pay for a lot of channels that you don't watch. Um, university libraries pay for packaged content regardless of the value or the use of each of those journal titles. Bigger is not always better. Until recently, little was known about how much universities do pay for these big deal bundles, in part because publishers have insisted that libraries sign confidentiality clauses. Ted and his colleagues used the Freedom of Information Act to obtain copies of big deal contracts signed by more than 50 institutions. And the results of their research have been published in July in Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. And they suggest that the big deal is a great deal for publishers, but not libraries or academics. UK biologist Ross Mounts of the University of Bath told the journal Nature that Bergstrom's paper is a must read um, because, quote, universities, <coughs> research institutes, and other subscribers are clearly being milked for every penny they can afford by the legacy academic publishers. They have a copyright protected monopoly over academic content. So it's my pleasure to introduce Ted, who holds the Sherry and Aaron Rasnick Chair in Economics at UCSB. Before coming here in 1997, he taught at the University of Michigan and Washington University in St. Louis. He earned his PhD in Economics from Stanford <coughs> and specializes in pure and applied microeconomic theory, and one of his many research interests is the economics of scholarly publishing. The UC libraries are using Ted's current and past research to vastly improve how we go about evaluating and investing in journals. His research is a catalyst for change that will help transform scholarly publishing. And the potential impact on campus authors is significant because it will affect 
the availability and accessibility of the scholarship needed for teaching and research. Uh, the format today, uh, Ted will speak for about 50 minutes and then take questions. And as we welcome Ted, we'd like to offer him a cool gift in <laughs> thanks and appreciation. And please join me in welcoming me, Dr. Ted Armstrong. So, yeah, I'll, um, <coughs> I've often thought it would be fun to engage in a little muckraking, and um, just for one time, I get a chance. So, we'll talk about these things. Well, <coughs> what got me started being interested in this topic was um, fairly simple. A few years ago, I decided, well, I have just more things, more papers to referee than I can possibly do. I have to figure out some way to decide which ones to say no to. And just kind of on a whim, I said, well, why don't I rank them by price, uh, the journals by price, and just work for the cheapest ones, as many of them as I can find time to do. And so in order to do that, I had to collect some price information about economics journals. and. Um, I wasn't expecting to see what I saw, because these very striking differences in what they were charging libraries. And um, so that got me curious about the subject, looking into other disciplines and the like, and starting to think about the economics of what's going on. And one thing leads to another. Um, <coughs> one project I got involved with, with um, colleague from Caltech was to um, study the, um, was to collect data on the subscription costs of individual journals and then to relate this to the number of citations to the journal, the number of articles in the journal, and so on, and to rank them um, or to, but we, we chose to um, <coughs> classify them as good deals bad deals in the middle, and to suggest that, uh, <coughs> well, our first thought was to suggest to scholars you might want to think about whether you want to do free, free labor for <coughs> overpriced journals. And then we also thought this might be of some use to libraries. Um, and we, the results we found were kind of striking. So um <coughs> the average Subscription price per article is about uh, three times, for the for-profits, is about three times of that of the average subscription price of the non-profits. And um, <coughs> this is true pretty much across disciplines. One thing I didn't know when I started this was, well, maybe the non-profits are subsidized somehow, and so these prices that that the, they're charging aren't the true cost. Maybe costs are really higher and you're just getting some subsidies. Well, it turned out, got to looking at how societies work, professional societies, most professional societies actually make a profit on their journal, on their journals. In fact, profits of the order of 20 or 30 percent are very common. They use those profits to subsidize their annual meetings, their professional activities, and so on. Usually the members aren't <coughs> don't complain about that because they say it goes to a good cause. And of course, they're, despite the fact that they, they're making profits, their cost prices are only a third of those of the for-profit. So <coughs> one of the arguments that was made, that we encountered, was people said, well, you know, these a la carte prices aren't really what libraries really pay for journals because they get discounts from the big publishers by buying these bundles that Janet was telling you a bit about. So, um, so you can <coughs> get all of the, essentially all of the journal, all of the journals published by, say, Elsevier for a single lump sum price. And that lump sum price is considerably less than the sum of the 
um, <coughs> all the cart prices of the stuff in the bundle. Of course, one thing you have to worry about is that uh, the, s the extra stuff you're getting is stuff you chose not to buy at the a la carte prices. So it's stuff you don't want very badly. And so it would be interesting to see what does it cost um, and to think about how big a discount are you really getting when you're getting a bundle. Well, that seemed like a worthy thing to explore, except that we found out fairly quickly when we asked librarians, can you tell us what you're paying? He said, no, we can't tell you what we're paying. <laughs> We've signed a contract that says we can't tell you. But several librarians also said, but why don't you use the Freedom in Information Act to make me tell you? And so, um, <coughs> so um, Preston and um, colleague Paul Courant, who is an economist who went on to um, rise to higher things, in fact, to be uh, the head librarian at the University of Michigan for a while. Um, and I decided to collect these prices and use the Freedom of Information Act. And this is what we did. And um, so um, Elsevier and Springer didn't like us doing that, and they actually went to court. They took Washington, we, they took Washington State University to court um, to tell them sued them to tell them, you don't tell Bergstrom what the hell you're charging. <laughs> and um, so it was kind of funny because <coughs> Washington State, as you know, is off in the Palouse, in the, in the boondocks of Washington. And the court proceedings happened in this little country courthouse in a small town, Colfax, Washington. And <coughs> also we were brought in there. Uh, I wasn't there, but I have heard accounts of it. Brought in there team, the most expensive uh, law firm in Seattle, and they brought him in to the farm town. The judge, um, <coughs> the judge told, t told them, no way, you've got no case. And um, he completely, <coughs> completely um, refused to, to do anything they told him to do. Um, I think they, that Elsevier had we looked at their document, their presentations, and they, I think the reason they chose to sue, a, sue Washington State was because there was some precedence in Washington where Boeing had gotten the courts to suppress some information. Now, it seemed to me fairly clear that in Washington State, Boeing can do anything they want, but there's no reason why Elsevier, which has the headquarters in England and the Netherlands can do what they want in Washington. Anyway, we won the, we won the case. Um, we also, um, there was a ruling in Texas um, that said we had access to it, and then they didn't try us in court anymore. So we found out the data. And so now it's interesting, what, what were they trying to hide? So now, well, we're not sure, but we could have some guesses. So we found out, for example, that um, <coughs> their even with the discounts, their prices per citation or per article, however you want to measure it, are much higher than the prices of the nonprofit publishers. Um, another thing we found out that I think they wouldn't want to be well known, that there are very striking differences in the amounts of money that rather similar universities pay for their subscription. And, um, <laughs> so we also found traces of evidence that um, universities that had bargained hard got better contracts. Um, perhaps that's not one case in point is the University of California. Perhaps it's not surprising that the University of California is able to bargain hard because it's so big, but um, we'll show, see some other examples as well. Just to get an idea of what these charges are. So these numbers right here are more recent ones that we've just, just been collecting in the last few months. But you get an idea. So if you were to buy, if you were a big university like uh, <coughs> with a research, a research one university, you'd be paying Elsevier on average about a million and three quarters dollars for their package and so on. And these other guys, um, significant amounts. 
Um, so how does that, so that doesn't tell us much until we look into what you're actually getting for that money. Um, but there's some clues about um, <coughs> that you're being over, overcharged. When we see the profit rates that these people report in their financial statements, um, so Elsevier, for example, reports profits of 39% of revenue is profit. Okay. That's an astonishingly good number from their point of view. Um, and of course, their profit is over their costs include some things that we might not think are really um, costs in the usual sense. So a, s a simple one is it pays its, it overpays its executives, or to, to my taste seems to. Um, CEO gets about eight point seven million, and he's got a whole raft of those guys. Um, spent thirty eight million dollars on lobbying in the United States last year. Um, only two million donating, only two million in donations to U.S. politicians' campaigns. You might think there's a, I guess they sell out cheap those guys, um, <coughs> but um, <coughs> the um, we can't find the numbers for what is spent with the European lobbying in Europe. But my guess, everybody says it's it's even more, considerably more than in the United States. Elsevier has a nice explanation. They say, well, um, the reason is, um, first of all, our prices aren't worse than average. And the reason we're making so much profit is that we have cut our costs so well. We're so efficient. Um, so we can kind of check on how, well, we can't really check on, well, we've all got a little check on the costs already, looking at the lobbying costs and so on. But um, we'll look at how their prices really do compare with competition. And you'll, you'll see there's a sense in which what he says is true and a sense in which it's not true. So when we compared the cost per citation of <coughs> the major publishing publishers' bundles and then um, <coughs> um, we did a similar, similar calculation for the nonprofit journal bundles. And let's start with the nonprofits to get some idea. So we took a sample of all the nonprofit publishers that published at least three um, journals that were <laughs> cited by the um, Web of Science and um, calculated their cost, the for example, the cost per citation for the prices they charge to a large university, their cost per citation. Um, the average was about a dollar. But in fact, some of the nonprofits are really very expensive for citation. And in fact, it would, seems like they'd be, be very sensible not to subscribe to these. If you get to exercise a little bit of choice in your nonprofits, you can get 95% um, of the citations that appear in nonprofit journals for um, a total of a cost of 80 cents per citation. And if you were a small library and say wanted just half of them, you'd spend about Forty cents per citation. So that's the nonprofits. What about for profits? Well, here they here they are. So Elsevier, the biggest one, the cost per citation, a little more than two dollars, two dollars, about two and a half times, two and three quarters times as much as the nonprofits. Um, but you look at the other publishers; they're even worse. Okay, so. You can kind of see why the, you can see, see some sense in what the Elsevier spokesman said. Well, you know, comparing his costs with his competition, if he counts his competition as the other for profits, he looks pretty good. And he might say, well, I'm kind of right in the middle between these guys and these guys and so on. But um, of course, from the point of view of the academic world, it means that we're paying um, you know, almost almost three times as much as what it seems to cost um, the uh, nonprofits to run these journals. Uh, we get similar numbers if we, instead of doing it per citation, we do it per article. One reason why you might want to think about costs per article is um, that citation practices differ across disciplines, um, <coughs> and so you might. Um, 
so in the humanities you may, you'll get fewer citations per article than in um, the medical sciences and so on. Um, and different publishers have different mixes of scientific, medical, and, uh, <coughs> and um, humanities publications. But even, but even when you do per article, which make, takes, which would eliminate the difference in citations, you still get a si very similar story. Um, a reason why you want to think about something more like citations than articles is, well, it's not very useful to get a junk journal that nobody reads or nobody cites, but still counts as articles. And so we'd like to, we like to use, uh, <coughs> you, we like to look at for citation. We'd like, we'd actually we'd like to look at for download if we had reliable download data, but that is so far we're just starting to put together. Okay. <coughs> so to get an idea of the discounts, I just will take one, one particular university as an example. This kind of pretty much tells you the story. So if you were going to subscribe to all of Elsevier's journals, the total cost would be about $3 million. Now the University of Michigan paid a little over $2 million for, its, for that package. So you might say, well, that's a 30% discount. Eh? That's 30% less than um, buying it one by one. And so, so the prices that also the looking at the list prices overstates the price by 30% if we're talking about Michigan. But that isn't quite a reasonable way to look at it because the extra stuff you're getting is stuff you didn't want in the first place. Um, and one way of seeing that, if Michigan had spent its money on a la carte, just on single subscription journals, it could have gotten about 90, a little more than 90% of all the citations that are in the Elsevier journals. So kind of more reasonably, you'd say, well, it's getting a 9% discount, not a 30% discount on um, the um, a la carte price. Um, so we can compare. Here's some comparisons from different professional societies, and this is Elsevier. As recall that Elsevier is the least bad of the, of the um, at least the least bad buy of the um, for profit, big for profits. And you see these major societies are just a heck of a lot cheaper um, <coughs> than Elsevier. Um, <coughs> that's whether you're looking for article, for citation, um, and so on. Now, <coughs> one of the things that happens is that um, librarians tell me that the commercial publishers maintain the fiction or try to maintain the fiction that your the price you're going to have to pay for your subscription this year is tied very rigidly to the total amount that you used to spend when big deals began. And this happened in a it's a kind of curious story about this, an interesting story about this. You see, back in about the year 2000, or just before the year 2000, a very few things were up online. And people still used these things called paper journals. And they'd open them, they'd go to libraries, and they'd sit there and read them. You know. um, and um, so in those days, there were no online subscriptions. And in fact, um, <coughs> perhaps rather curiously, um, the big publishers had a single price that they would charge to libraries. Often there'd be a different price for individuals, but the library price was the same, whether you were a giant library or a little library. And this made some sense for them because big universities would have several disciplinary libraries and special places, and they'd need several paper copies. And so they'd get more money out of big, big universities than out of little ones anyway. Um, but at, so at this time, they had a very nice indicator of the total willingness to pay of a library for, or of a university for its bundle of journals. 
they know that it's willing to pay at least as much as it was paying for all of the paper that it was subscribing to before. But now we had this new technical development. They could, without any extra cost to them, give you access to the electronic version of everything they publish. And so they now have a signal of how much that would be worth. They know that access to everything they publish is going to be worth more than you were, they were, you were paying for the paper, how much more they can't be sure, but they made a guess. They, in fact, <coughs> when they made the, their first contracts of this kind, they charged you about 15% more than you were paying before, <coughs> that you were paying for 15% more than you were paying for paper in the old days. And then they signed a five-year contract in which they guaranteed that their price would not go up by more than 7% per year. Um, guess what? What percent it went up by? 7% per year, precisely. Um, <coughs> the later, after the first five years, the contracts, well, many, many, some of the publishers at least moved, moved their, reduced their rate of increase to 5% and sometimes even 4%. But um, this is what they did. So. Today, even today, um, the, the rhetoric, publisher's rhetoric is, well, you have a historic spend, and of course your contract is going to be, um, your hor his your histor take your historic bundle of journals, ramp up their prices by the percent increase we've agreed to, and that's, that's what, that's what uh, you're gonna pay today. We'll, of course, give you access to everything we publish, and, um, of course, we'll give you a five-year contract in which we'll guarantee that your prices will rise by no more than such and such percent, maybe four percent, maybe six percent, and so on. Okay, so I think one of the things the publishers, reasons the publishers didn't want this data, this um, actual prices paid data made available is that not everybody was abiding by this. Some were bargaining hard and getting better deals. And you, can <coughs> and you can see some of the evidence in the prices that are actually paid. Uh, just a couple of examples. Um, <coughs> if you look at the rate of increase in prices over the period from 2005 to 2014, you'll see a good deal of variation. So Iowa apparently didn't bargain very hard. Their price went up by 61% over this period. California took a firmer stance. And its prices went up by 28% over this period. Another striking difference is, <coughs> um, these, this is a, in 2000, and this is a 2010 price that I thought was a very striking difference. So Michigan and Wisconsin are very similar universities as far as their size and number of, number of PhDs and size of faculty and so on. Um, Michigan was spending about 2.2 million and Wisconsin 1.2 million on their Elsevier contracts. Now in this case, I think what happened was Wisconsin for a long time did not make a big deal contract and before and and while it had no big deal contract, it was cleaning out all of its small libraries, dropping their subscriptions, getting down to a single subscription. So it had a much slower spending base when it went into its contract with Elsevier. But I suspect there was also some very hard bargaining in the process. Here's some other information about the kind of variation you can see between similar universities. So roughly speaking, the green ones are places that got their subscriptions relatively cheaply. The red ones paid relatively much. Um, here's the UC. What I did here was I took the total, this is a, these are a 2009 price. I took the total the UC paid and divided by nine because there were nine campuses. Um, and so just to get a, some perspective. Um, actually, since 2009, the UC has continued to do better than most campuses because it, it drove a very hard bargain, again, in its most recent contract. And <coughs> um, so you see this kind of, another 
place you see a pretty good deal is Texas. And um, Texas, rather like the UC, um, has bargains for the, um, all, of the all of the Texas or major Texas universities come a bargain through a single <coughs> agency. And <coughs> um, um, if you, <coughs> okay, so it seems pretty clear that, tho that, that these two instances where they've used some genuine bargaining power, they, um, Elsevier or any publisher would really hate to lose the UC. Um, and uh, it would, you know, its journals would lose prestige. It, UC, if the UC didn't subscribe, how can it be any good? Um, and so on. And <coughs> um, now, other universities have little consortia where they jointly subscribe, but their consortia don't have any teeth. Okay, but the UC, at least my understanding is that um, if, say, the Elsevier contract broke down um, with the central authority, Elsevier and the UCSB could not get together and make their own deal. I don't think they could. Although I imagine, UC, I imagine UCSB could subscribe to individual journals, but couldn't do a package. Um, but that gives it a bargaining power that the other, <coughs> so for example, say the, the Big Ten has a, has a consortium, um, well, the former Big Ten, wherever they now, they've added Nebraska and Rutgers and God knows what. Um, but they have a consortium, and a consortium of libraries, and, and Penn State, <laughs> uh, a consortium of libraries. But in fact, you can buy. You can either join the consortium, or you can buy it yourself, and or you can buy through another consortium. Some do that, and so there's no teeth. There's no bargaining teeth in that, <coughs> as far as I can tell. <coughs> um, I want to talk a little bit about just kind of um, so the, what economics lies behind this. Um, actually, I've <coughs> this bit of bit is I was asked to give a lecture to the um, to the Ivy League provosts, and they wanted me to talk about. Um, let's see, these guys were meeting to say um, about academic journal prices. My job was to, to tell what was wrong, and then somebody else was to tell what to do. I don't know that I wasn't convinced by the other guys, but I tried to resist. Tell Nobody can really resist telling university provosts what to do, of course. <laughs> I, uh, but, uh, um, so I'd like you to think about the, um, this kind of peculiar market. So <coughs> when librarians are shopping for journals, they're a little like doctors who choose drugs or college professors choosing textbooks. Um, they're making choices for consumers. The, they, the librarian makes the choice. The consumer isn't even spending his own money. Just, you know, the, the <coughs> with the drugs, the insurance company pays for the drug. With the textbooks, um, mom and dad pay for the textbooks. <coughs> we call chatting with a guy <coughs> at, the, at the Arbor about a couple of years ago about the, the textbook prices. He says, you know, I don't mind that they cost so much, you know, because what happens is uh, the more they cost, what after, after the course is over, I can bring them back, sell them back for half price, and get beer. And so my parents pay, you know, this is great. Um, <coughs> so um, as far as I know, librarians don't get to sell the journals back and buy beer, but, <coughs> um, but they are shopping for customers that aren't paying. The customers, you know, um, um, <coughs> well, let's, let's look. So I claim that the way that faculty show their um, desires, it's not entirely credible. Um, the, um, the bitching method, um, or I don't know, I've heard it said, um, no, it's, Somebody was, librarian was telling me, well, this faculty member said, it's absolutely essential that I have access to this journal. And the translation is, absolutely essential as long as somebody else is paying for it. Uh, 
um, <coughs> so that's a, a problem. Another problem is that these big deals are very complicated. So there's you know, a couple of thousand journals. They're in hundreds of fields. There's nobody, nobody in the world knows what this journal is worth, this package is worth. So uh, that's a second problem or third problem. Yet another problem is, okay, well, these things, these features that I've talked about, the delegation of purchasing, the unreliable signals, the complexity of the bundle, these are the kind of things that make demand very inelastic, that is, very unresponsive to price. And that is just lovely territory for monopolists if they can get there. And in fact, it turns out that the journal business is very nicely set up for monopolists because, first of all, you have copyright, so nobody can produce exactly your same product. But the other thing is you have this um, coordination equilibrium that's very hard to break. Okay, if you have a journal with a good reputation, um, you will you will know that good authors will send you their papers. You will know that good libraries will subscribe to you. Good libraries subscribe to you because good authors send their papers to you. Good readers will read you because good authors, good libraries have you. Um, each feeds on the other. And once you're in place, it's very hard for anybody else to compete with you. Okay. And so <coughs> this has given these publishers tremendous monopoly power. The other thing they have done is they've combined, um, <coughs> there's been tremendous amounts of buyout, uh, buyouts, so we, only, we now only have a rather small number of major publishers. Um, yeah, well, I say there. Um, maybe some of you remember California Electrical Power. We had a similar story there. The state agreed to put a price ceiling on what consumers had to pay for electricity. The state would buy it what, whatever it cost and to sell at prices no higher than the ceiling. This meant that the wholesale demand for uh, electricity was extremely inelastic. You charge pretty much what you want. And guess what happened? My friend from Enron popped in. Um, so, okay, so what happens with the journals? Well, we've talked about some of these things already. Um, yeah, I don't know that I want to spend your time on that. So let's, let's ask whether um, open access will help, okay? Um, first, a little bit of pessimism. So what does the stock market say? So Elsevier's stock price has doubled in the last two years. Um, and uh, there's a stock market analyst that I've talked to a few times who for a long time was maintaining that you should sell Elsevier short because open access is going to break them. And this hasn't happened, and now this fellow has changed his mind. I read his, his um, new statement can't say that he gives any reason why he's changed his mind, other than my guess is he's, you know, I'm tired of being wrong. <laughs> <laughs> um, here's another number that helps me to think about this problem. So with the current publishing situation, if we take Elsevier's reported profits and divide by the number of articles that in Elsevier journals that are also um, ranked by, or that are also included in the ISI Web of Science, we find that the revenue, Elsevier's revenue per article published is about $12,000. Profit per article is about $4,700. Um, now that, those are interesting numbers when we compare them to the um, some open access numbers, which we'll talk about in a minute. But I did want to talk about, let's see, what's happened with open access so far? Well, about 13% of all journals, these are, these are again, I'm considering ISI listed journals, and, and not, there are thousands of spam journals that are mo mostly, mostly junk, um, 
and I'm not counting them. There, I will have, will have missed some good ones that didn't get yet counted by ISI. But here's the fraction of journals. The fraction of articles, about 8%. The fraction of citations that go to these open access journals, about 5%. So it's making some inroads, but it's hasn't, hasn't gotten very far yet. Um, <coughs> there's also some of the commercial guys have this hybrid model where you can publish in a subscription journal, but your article will be open access, will be available to everyone if you pay a special fee, on, if the author pays a fee on the order of $3,000. Um, here's the fees by various publishers for their open access. What's happened so far, now, an interesting thing is to compare this 3,000 with the 12,000 fits. 3,000 is smaller than 12,000. So if these guys really thought that people were going to take up their offer to go open access, then of course, if everybody was going to do that, nobody would subscribe to their journals, and they'd be getting $3,000 per article. That hasn't been happening. The uptake has been small, and in fact, Probably there's no evidence so far that it's been enough to make, well, it certainly hasn't been enough to make the publishers reduce their prices and hasn't, doesn't seem to have been enough to make libraries stop subscribing, at least not very fast. Here are some other um, <coughs> open access charges. S it has surprised me how high, it has used to surprise me at least how high these are. Um, so the the um, most significant open access publisher is the Publi Public Library of Sciences, which has really, really prestigious journals in biology and medicine and so on. Um, and its charges per, per, per author, to the author pays somewhere between 2250 and 2900 for having his article published. Now, often it's not the article author who pays, but the granting agency, if he's, a, if he's a medical researcher, he'll have his, the NIH pay it. Um, <coughs> there's this journal Plus One, which op does open access publishing, um, does a lighter, lighter job of reviewing, um, seems to have a more efficient technology, um <coughs> do, and um, has a price of has a price of thirteen fifty and. By all accounts, plus one makes profits that cross-subsidize the, the expensive plus journals. And here are some other professional society journals and their prices. <coughs> okay. Now, you can see that if these things were to take over from the Elsevier, the Elseviers of the world, in fact, um, we would have a very considerable saving to the system. It would be on the order of two or three thousand dollars per article instead of twelve thousand dollars per article. But that's not going to happen easily because you've got this problem is who is it who's paying for the who's paying the twelve thousand? Well that's spread all over the world. Uh, buyers everywhere. So so they there's a large market in Japan, a large market in Europe, a large, even a growing market in China. There's subscribers all over the world. Who pays the author publication fee? Well, the author or his own university or his own funding agency. Um, so it wouldn't be profitable. It wouldn't make sense for, say, the, even the University of California. It, it would, would not, the University of California would not break even if it paid um, $3,000 for each article published by each of its faculty members and dropped its subscriptions to, to the, uh, <coughs> um, all the commercial journals. Um, <coughs> and so it's not easy to see just how we would move from position A to position B. Another thing, though, is that, well, I'm just about, okay, I'll finish quickly. Um, not, all, not all open access journals are expensive. So 71% of them currently have no author publication fee. Um, they provide about a third of the citations from open access.
process. Some are subsidized, and so it, there isn't really much cost could be high anyway because the government pays or sometimes a society pays for a single um, <coughs> uh, open access publication. Some have, are playing loss leaders. They just want to get popular and then they'll raise their prices. Um, but some have very low costs. And I happen to know about one example that I participated in founding. Um, we, we charge $75 to submit your article with no author publication fee. The <coughs> um, editor worked for free. He used he uh, used the server at the University of Toronto, um, used free um, journal management software. And um, the only real paid labor was a uh, graduate student who would edit the LaTeX files that people would turn in. Um, so this journal not only lived on the $75 submission fee, but it actually had more, more money than it, need <laughs> than it needed to cover its costs. Um, <coughs> there's, there's some other examples of that sort I can mention there. Um, let's see, I think this, I've pretty much flown through my time here. I think we'll just wrap this up. Uh, if you have uh, questions or let's see. Mm -hmm. What was the um, acceptance rate for mm -hmm. articles in that journal? It was about, I, I suppose, one in six or something like that. Um, okay, yeah. so, uh, so effectively yeah. it was getting yeah. what? $400 or something, yeah. $1,500 or, yeah, $450 yeah. Uh -huh. uh, yeah. per yeah. article yeah. published. Cor correct, yeah, uh -huh. yeah, right, uh -huh. yeah. Um, and, <coughs> of course, that... Um, that, I think, is, in my opinion, it's a very good idea for journals to work that way. Um, from the author's point of view, even if your paper is rejected, you still get a report from some competent scholars in your discipline. Um, my goodness, I mean, get, if you get paying $150 for somebody to spend an afternoon working on your paper, <laughs> seems really, really cheap. Um, so as far as of course, so sometimes the referees are very sloppy and don't give you good value, but on average you get <coughs> decent value. There's, so that part seems to me as far as fairness. It also seems to me that um, um, if there is an author fee, a, a sub submission fee, there's a little bit of incentive to self-select. You, you decide, well, if I think my chances of getting published here are really small, um, and it costs me money. Eh, I'll go somewhere else where I think I can get published. And so um, and that, I think, is a good thing. Um, in general, it strikes me as weird that you pay, let's see, you may, so some of, some, a lot of people submit their papers. Some of them you want, some of them you don't want. Who do you make pay? You make the guy whose paper you want pay rather than the guys whose paper you don't want. That seems backwards. But anyway, that's the way we economists think. The yeah. hard scientists think, think, I think that's crazy. Yeah, I, I, I believe they are. Um, so, well, I know, for example, Michigan librarians are very, <laughs> very flustered to hear this <laughs> news. They didn't know it. This for, I was amazed that they didn't know it. After all, they were would be friends and so on, but they really didn't know it, and they were just just you know astonished and made me made me double check and you know checked with Wisconsin and so on. Um, I also know that I've talked to many. Or corresponded with many librarians who are very interested in seeing these numbers, and presumably one of the reasons is they want to want to know, you know, are we getting taken? Um, uh, let's see. Um, in fact, Mm-hmm. 
<laughs> okay. Okay. Please, if you.